This conference will now be recorded. There you go, George. Okay, tonight we are going to discuss the second episode of Rick Atkinson's book, The British Are Coming. And I, I really do want to encourage you to read this book not because there might be a huge amount of information that that you don't aren't familiar with but what he does is he takes events and makes them come alive he really does an excellent job at that so instead of dates and places and figures and all the rest of it he talks about the experiences and he makes them very very understandable very personal so I want to encourage you to read it. It's the only one of the books that's out. Jerry asked me a little while ago, uh, when would we go on to start volume two? It, it has not been published yet, and it may be a while. Okay, quickly, just an overview of what happened, and this is one year, 1776. An overview of what happened in 1776 says it began auspiciously when the British abandoned Boston. However, what the British were doing while Boston was under siege is they were forming a large armada, both army and navy. And early in 76, it was dispatched from England. At almost the same time, and talked a little bit about this last time, the colonials abandoned Canada. Now, the first thing that actually happened in the colonies after Boston was a battle for the city of Charleston, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that battle. It was defeated by the southern colonial forces. Then the focus shifted to Long Island and New York City. And Washington, who had a very sizable continental army in New York, was soundly beaten by the British Army and Navy. Next, the retreating colonials who came out of Canada were defeated in a naval battle on Lake Champlain. That battle took place as the British were heading towards Ticonderoga. However, Ticonderoga was saved at least for that year. The year ended with Washington defeating the British at the Battle of Trenton. Now, in 1775, <clears throat> Britain had a very large navy, but it did not have a large standing army, and in fact, it never did have a large standing army. And their army was all over the globe. They were at home in the British Isles. They were in the Mediterranean. They were in the Caribbean. They were in India. The Brits had their forces spread pretty doggone thin as far as the army is concerned. The army was not their strength. Now, in the 18th century, it was common for countries to lease an army if they needed it. And I'm going to talk about what that meant because that's where a sizable portion of the army that fought in our revolution came from. Britain assembled a task force, army and navy, to send west. And if you read the details about putting that task force together, it was just a nightmare. The number of ships that were needed, the kinds of troops that were needed, getting them all together and getting them in, in movement, the supply system that was needed to support them, it was a huge undertaking. That task force took months to assemble, to arm it and logistically prepare it for service 3,000 miles away. Now, at the time they were also preparing, in addition to the larger expeditions, a Southern expedition. That was planned, but not very carefully, and the effort itself was chaotic. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. Transport was a major issue. 
The ships that were needed took months to assemble. They were actually building ships for this. That's how many different kinds of ships were needed. It wasn't just ships of war, it was transports, it was supply ships. Just think of what it took to move the, the, the logistically to move horses, feed, feed for the troops, ammunition, cannon, etc. That fleet departed Britain in February of 1776, months behind schedule. Now you've heard the term Hessians, right? Do you know who they were? They were German soldiers who served as auxiliaries to the British Army. The largest contingent of these was from the state of Hesse in Germany. But actually, many of the German troops were not from Hesse. They were from other parts of Germany. Hey, George. Yes. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but just back up a little bit. You said that they, they arrived here in February of 1776. No, was what there, I said was that's when they left. When they left, okay. But was there a declaration of war? Or, or Yes, they had, they had already, uh, the king sometime late in the summer of 75 declared that the colonies were in rebellion and that he was going to take every effort necessary to quell the rebellion. Okay, thanks. Okay. George, is it, is it fair to say these were mercenaries? No, I'll talk about that. Okay. 35,000 Germans fought for the British in our revolution. That was a third of the British land forces who fought in the colonies. They were disciplined, skilled soldiers. They performed well in battle. They were not a motley crowd of, of anybody you could scrape up off the bottom of the barrel. They were distinguished as auxiliaries, not mercenaries. They served a foreign government as a unit on their own accord. So they weren't doing it as individuals. They were doing it as units. They were soldiers hired out to a foreign party by their own government. So what Great Britain was doing was paying the state of Hesse and whatever other states that were involved for the services of these units. They remained in service to their own government. They, they were not in service to Great Britain. They served as entire units. They fought under Hessian flags. They were commanded by Hessian officers. They wore their own uniforms. They were not British troops. 50% of that 35,000 never returned home. Among other things, Congress offered defectors 50 acres of farmland to desert, and many did so. The use of foreign mercenaries was one of the 27 colonial grievances against George III in the Declaration of Independence. So that's who the Hessians were. And I'm gonna talk quite a bit about the Hessians towards the end of the program. Now, where'd the money come from to fund this? As my mother would say, follow the money. First of all, a lot of it, they just printed. Look at how much money was printed by the Congress or by the states, backed by nothing. So that 110 million pounds sterling had no underlying coinage to support it. They also borrowed money. The states borrowed money. And one of the issues in the eventual formation of the United States was which states borrowed how much money and how are they going to pay for it? They also had something called congressional debt certificates. The Continental Army Quartermaster would use these debt certificates to pay for food, for fodder for animals or whatnot with these debt certificates. They got money from foreign loans. And I was surprised 
not really very much of what they obtained to support the revolution came from foreign loans. I thought more than that. And then Congress <clears throat> floated something called a domestic bond. These were 6% savings bonds. So that's where the 165 million pounds sterling came from. By 1781, inflation was 16,000% of what it had been in 1775. If you print money with nothing to back it up, sooner or later, it loses its value. Okay, now I'm gonna go back a little bit and take you back to Boston. The siege of Boston began in June of the previous year after Lexington, Concord, and Breeds Hill. Washington took command there in July. He wanted to attack Boston. He had 15,000 Continental soldiers, and he wanted to attack, but he could not ever come up with a plan to attack that was just not Im impractical. Following Breed's Hill, for the better part of nine months, there were minor sorties from both sides but no good opportunity could be developed. Both sides had terrible supply problems, terrible health problems, and poor morale. In March of 1776, the colonists fortified Dorchester Heights, like I said last time, with heavy cannon that had been dragged from the Ticonderoga. So the British force, and this is who was actually in Boston, so it was surrounded by 15,000 Continentals. There were 10,000 British troops in Boston. They fled with the Navy to Halifax to reorganize. They were gone and they never came back. Now, I've never seen this before, but I think it's really kind of interesting. What was the British strategy in the revolution? They didn't just send troops over here and say, go find the Continentals and kill them. The plan in 1776 was to capture New York City. That was the primary plan, make it a base of operations and also to secure Canada as their base from the north. After securing the bases, then they would start Howe's army from New York up the Hudson River and they were supposed to meet Guy Carleton's army coming from Quebec south, somewhere around Albany. That was the that was the major effort. Their objective was to isolate New England. They thought that New England was the hotbed of the rebellion. If they could isolate it, the rest of the colonies would fold. A secondary objective was to strike the center of gravity, the Patriot capital at Philadelphia, come up the Chesapeake and hit Philadelphia. Then a smaller force was going to be sent south to occupy the colonies of North and South Carolina, primarily to support the loyalists who were living there. So that was the strategy that they were working from. It wasn't a bad strategy. Now, the first fight was in the Carolinas. The strategy of this force was to attack the Carolinas, in particular, Charleston, while Howe's main army headed for New York City. In Charleston, there were 6,500 colonials. The British only had about 2,500 troops. Colonial forces were under the command of Charles Lee, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Charles Lee as we go along. The Brits totally controlled the sea, or at least they thought they did, because there wasn't any colonial navy to speak of in that area. And they felt that with the sea, they could do just about anything they wanted. Now, what happened was <clears throat> the colonists built a palmetto fort here on Sullivan's Island, and its function was to protect the approach to Charleston Harbor, which was up in here. 
The British plan was to land on what was then called Long Island, now called the Isle of Palm, cross Breach Inlet here, and attack this fort, which has eventually come to be called Fort Moultrie from the flank. Meanwhile, the Navy was going to destroy the fort from the sea. It's not the way it turned out. The British could not get across the inlet, so the land part of the fighting never took place. Worse than that, Fort Moultrie, which had these palmetto logs as its primary protection, really did a very good job of crossing havoc with these British ships out here in the channel. Eventually, <clears throat> the invasion of South Carolina failed. They withdrew and they did not return until 1780. That was the battle in the Carolina. General Charles Lee is an interesting character. He served as a general, general in the Continental Army during the Revolution. He had served earlier in the British Army during the Seven Years' War. He had a commission during the Seven Years' War, but he sold his commission and he served for a time in the Polish Army. So he was a soldier of fortune. He came to North America, and he's not the only one who came over for the fight. He came to North America in 1773. He bought an estate in Virginia. His ambition was to become commander in chief of the Continental Army. In 1776, he was leading the, the forces that uh, attempted to capture Charleston. However, and I'm going to talk some more about him later, he was captured by the British as the Continental Army retreated across New Jersey and he was held until exchanged in 1778. He was involved in some serious skullduggery with Gates, among others, against Washington. He later led an assault at Monmouth. That miscarried. He was court-martialed for that, and he died in Philadelphia in 1782. So he was he was a fairly significant figure in the in the revolution. He was a failure. Remember, I talked about Arnold. He was a significant feature in the revolution. Who hey, George, what was Charles Lee related to the other Virginia Lees? No. I do not believe so. If he was, I didn't find anything that said that he was. Okay, next, let's talk a little bit about the Second Continental Congress. They convened in Philadelphia. In the winter of 76, they moved to Baltimore because they were apprehensive about the British coming down through New Jersey and capturing Philadelphia, which they eventually did, but not in 76. Appointments to the delegates was generally by popular convention, although in some instances what happened was a state assembly or a colony assembly would appoint their delegates. There were two factions in the Congress. First, there was the conservative faction who were led by John Jay, and they tried to petition George III to stop the fighting. They offered, they made a peace offering. They being the Continental Congress made a peace offering to the King of England. He turned it down. Then there were radicals led by John Adams of Massachusetts and Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. And they were constantly bickering about what they should do about just about everything that came before Congress to consider. John Hancock was elected president. Remember I talked about him last time in the early of 1776. In June of 76, they adopted the Resolution of Independence. This was at the same time they framed this model treaty and the Articles of Confederation. Those Articles of Confederation are what eventually the 13 colonies formed the United States under and were found to be totally inadequate. They could not levy taxes. So they printed money and they borrowed more. Their financing was 
totally dependent on gaining independence. Had independence failed, that money would have been like Confederate money. Okay, leaving Canada. And I'm not really floating around because these happened pretty much in sequence as far as time was concerned. The Continental Attack, Christmas Eve of 1775, failed. Montgomery was killed. However, the American, the Continental forces, remained in siege. Benedict Arnold was in charge. British reinforcements didn't arrive until May of 1776. At about the same time, Arnold then started retreating up the St. Lawrence and then down towards Lake Champlain. Ben Franklin, as a functionary of Congress, came to Montreal to negotiate, okay, trying to get French Canada, the 14th colony. He was unsuccessful. They really weren't interested. I don't know why the French weren't interested in, in uh, joining the revolution, but they weren't. Now, then what happened was the Americans, the Continental Force, withdrew all the way down to Ticonderoga. Okay, and I think that's somewhere down around in here. Both sides then started building a navy for an anticipated battle on that lake. They felt that Lake Champlain, which then feeds into Lake George, was a thoroughfare. And if you can see, they're almost connected to the Hudson River coming north. They started building ships. The British actually sent over whole unassembled frigates to be assembled up here on the um, up here just at the northern tip of uh, Lake Champlain. <coughs> Benedict Arnold was in charge of building the American Navy. So the first major naval warfare of the revolution was going to take place on Lake Champlain. I thought you might be interested in this. I'm going to pull a Jerry on this and just tell you a little bit about, remember there were 13 governors, actually 12, in the crown colonies. Where'd they go when all this happened? They were administered by royal governors who were representative of the crown and they had a, a number of different kinds of charters and I, I'm not going to pretend like I knew the differences, know the differences in their charters. Two of them, the governor of New Hampshire and Gage, who was the governor of Massachusetts, came to Boston and they fled when Boston was evacuated. Two of them, the governor of Connecticut and the governor of Rhode Island, joined the Patriot cause. One, William Franklin, who was Ben Franklin's son, remained, but he also remained a Tory. So New Jersey continued to have a Tory governor until he was kicked out of office, I think in about 78, but I'm not sure of the date. Two of them, New York and North Carolina, fled to New York City. One, Georgia, retained partial control of the colony of Georgia until 1782. So he stayed in place and he retained control of the colony. Now, if you're doing your math, you'd realize that's not 13. Four of them, Maryland, South Carolina, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, all fled to England. Now, that's 12. The 13th was Delaware, and Delaware had no governor. It was actually administered as part of Pennsylvania. Next, late summer, 76, the Battles of Long Island. Washington came to New York City in April of 76 with the Continental Army. And there is a difference between the Continental Army, which was under the auspices of the Second Continental Congress, and militias. There were a sizable number of state militias. So if you were looking at a given action, it might have 
half of it might be Continental Army and half of it might be the militia. Washington immediately began to, to fortify the city and Long Island, the southern part of Long Island down in here. The British arrived in June. Remember that fleet that I was telling you about? They didn't actually get to the colonies until June. With a large army and fleet, it was commanded by Admiral Howe and the army was commanded by his brother, General Howe. After several feints, Washington's problem with all of his forces, he had 30,000 men, were where are they going to strike? Are they gonna come up the river? Are they gonna come up the river? Are they gonna hit Long Island? Where are they going? And because they had such total control of the water, he could not forecast where they were going to, so he had to spread his forces all to hell and gone. In a night march, the British came across from Staten Island, landed on Long Island, came up to the forces, and by then, Washington's forces were here on uh, Long Island, and the British marched around and hit Washington's left flank from the side. They immediately overran Washington's forces on the left, and he had to withdraw to Brooklyn. The Continentals retreated to Brooklyn Heights, <clears throat> where they were assaulted several, several times, but Howe did not decide on a final assault while they were in, in Brooklyn Heights. On August the 30th, the Continental Army withdrew to Manhattan. And it was more than just a, a simple withdrawal. They had been soundly defeated. They did not suffer a tremendous number of casualties, but they had been badly beaten by the British. Now back to back to Lake Champlain, the Battle of Valcour Island. I'd never even heard of this. As the Americans, this is all though in a time sequence, as the Americans withdrew from Montreal, the British pursued. Ticonderoga was the prize. Both sides were building a fleet of naval warships. The British ships were the stronger, but there were a number of um, colonial ships that were carrying 15, 20, and 25 cannon. These were not rowboats. Benedict Arnold led the American fleet. General Carlton led the British fleet. Their focus was Ticonderoga and the Hudson River. They met in a pitched sea battle on October the 11th. The British were victorious. Arnold's fleet eventually was decimated, but they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish because they delayed the campaign until the winter. Carlton's forces actually drew near to Ticonderoga, but by the time they got there and they looked at that as fort, and they were outside the fort and they decided to withdraw and they withdrew all the way up Lake Champlain as the winter settled in. Both sides went into winter quarters. General Guy Carlton, he was an Anglo-Irish soldier. He twice was the governor of Quebec. He also was the governor general of British North America. He commanded British troops in the War of Independence, leading the defense of Quebec. So he's the one that defeated the colonials at Quebec. He also led the 1776 counteroffensive that drove the rebels out of the province. By 1782, he was the commander in chief of all British forces in North America. He was the person who carried out the Crown's promise of freedom to slaves. If a slave joined the British Army during the Revolution, they were set free. He oversaw the evacuation of British forces, loyalists, and freedmen from New York City in 1783 to transport them to a British colony, E. Carlton. Now, back to New York. 
now October of 1776. Howe landed on Manhattan in force in September. And what happened on Manhattan was Washington fought a retrograde series of battles. He slowly withdrew north on Manhattan all the way to White Plains. I don't know if you know where White Plains is. It's about 25 miles south of West Point. It's on the east bank. of the Hudson. Washington withdrew the bulk of his forces to White Plains and Howe pursued. Now, he did not withdraw them all. There was a very important port left on the Hudson River on Manhattan Island. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But first, Howe had to deal with the main forces of uh, Washington. Several small skirmishes slowed their advance, but eventually they caught up with, with Washington. At White Plains, Washington didn't see the risk. And this happened more than once. His right flank was up in the air. The British overran the small force there. Washington's army was beaten and they started to withdraw. They had nowhere to go, really. But instead of pursuing him, Howe turns south to Fort Washington on the Hudson. There were two forts <clears throat> down on the Hudson River on Manhattan and on the Jersey Shore. One was Fort Washington here. The other was Fort Lee over on the Jersey Shore. As I said, Howe, instead of Instead of trying to destroy the rest of, of Washington's army, which possibly could have been done, he decided to come back and get Fort Washington. Its role was to protect the Hudson River. I don't know that you've ever heard of this, but the other main protection of the Hudson River was a chain across the Hudson up at West Point. Hudson or Fort Washington was strongly garrisoned, but it was not easily defensible. The map shows you how the British attacked Washington and General Greene. And I'm going to probably talk about Greene at some future time. He was one of America's heroes. They underestimated how vulnerable that fort was. As a simple example, it had no water. It had no wells. They had to get water out of the river. That's not a very good plan. On the 16th of November, it was assaulted and it surrendered very quickly with heavy casualties. Most of the casualties were prisoners of war. The entire garrison surrendered and there was something like 1,500 Continentals slapped in chains. Fort Lee, across the river, was then abandoned. And the Continental Army then headed west. That's this way. This map is uh, north is this way on this map. Continental Army headed west into New Jersey. New York City was abandoned, and it would not ever be retaken until the treaty was signed with the British. Now, Washington's retreat across New Jersey. Whoops. Once Wash Fort Washington fell, Washington actually de divided his army into three sections. One of them, under Lee, went north to Peekskill and eventually came across here. The other two sections came this way. Lee remained in Westchester County, where the main army had withdrawn after White Plains. There were about 10,000 men here and about 10 or 12,000 men here. Although Lee was reported to have 10,000, he really only had about 5,500 effective. With the rest of the army, Washington retreated across New Jersey and his army slowly disappeared because their enlistments ran out on the march. 
leaving with 10,000 men in early November. By the end of November or early December, he had less than 5,000 left. So the army was disappearing. There was desertion. There were enlistments that were up. There were wounded people. It was, it was the, the, the revolution was in great peril in November of 1776. Then Lee was captured. And if you read about how he was captured, and again, like I said, in the book, he does a really good job of, of telling you the kinds of stories about what was going on. He was caught in a boarding house. <laughs> he was caught in a rooming house. But some of his troops joined Washington. They retreated together across at Trenton, across the Delaware. His aide de camp was Thomas Paine. How much do you know about Thomas Paine? I did not know nearly as much as I thought. He was an English born activist, philosopher, and revolutionary. He did not come to the colonies until 1774. He wrote, common sense in 1776, crystallizing the spirit of the revolution. On the retreat, and he was coming across with Washington by now, he wrote the first article of the American Crisis pamphlet. If you haven't ever heard these words, I'm surprised. These are the times that try men's soul. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. He later became involved in the French Revolution. He was imprisoned by the French and freed with the help of James Monroe. Common sense. It's a 47 page pamphlet written in 1776. And what it was, was the common colonists' justification for leaving the English crown. He used simple arguments to encourage common people to fight for an egalitarian government. Egalitarian means no royalty. It was published anonymously and it sold out. In proportion to the population of the colonies, it had the largest sale and circulation of any, I didn't know this, of any book ever published in American history. It made a case for independence because up until now, this was a thing that was being led by rabble, but the common person didn't really know what was going on. It connected independence with common dissenting Protestant beliefs. It presented an American political identity as if it were a sermon. I've not ever read Common Sense, but I think I might give it a try. France buys in. The French saw the revolt as opportunity and danger. The opportunity was to get back at the English. The danger was if the English won, France might be next on their list. They set up a dummy corporation. Its function was to provide military support for the revolution, but not be connected to the government. And a sizable amount of money got funneled into this dummy corporation. They shipped gunpowder, saltpeter, brass cannons, muskets, uniform, tentage, the whole nine yards. This is where the colonies got their supplies from. They got them from France. American agents spurred them on. The king would not participate in this process. He was the king being Louis XIV, I guess. Benjamin Franklin arrived in December to officially petition the French government, and if you've ever read about Franklin's time in, in France, it took him a long time to get their support. France also sent soldiers of fortune to include the Marquis de Lafayette. Who was he? He was a French aristocrat. Look at the date he was born, 1757. He was convinced that the American revolutionary cause was noble, and he came to the New World seeking glory in it. They made him a major general at the age of 19, but they didn't give him any troops to command. In the middle of the war, he went back to France <clears throat> to lobby for an increase in French support. 
He returned in 1780, was given senior positions in the Continental Army. He was a factor in trapping Cornwallis at Yorktown. Later, he was an advocate for constitutional monarchy. He was called a traitor by Robespierre, but he survived the reign of terror. Trenton. Washington retreated across the Delaware at Trenton, a small town, less than a thousand people. It was garrisoned by four regiments of Hessian troops. 1,400 men garrisoned this town of a thousand. They were led by a very competent commander, a colonel named Rawl. He had been 35 years a soldier of fortune. He was neither careless nor intoxicated the morning of the attack. Neither were his troops. But, but Washington had a spy in Trenton who de detailed the defensive positions of the town to Washington. Not only that, the garrison was supported by another town six miles south called Bordentown. It had an additional 1,500 men. However, they were busy chasing raiders south and they were not available when Washington crossed the Delaware. By now, the entire Continental Army in the, in the middle of the United Colonies had less than 6,000 troops effective. If they didn't make a major impact in the struggle then and there, there would be no Continental Army by the spring of 1777. So Washington had a number of boats constructed, and these also were not rowboats. These were sizable boats to go across the Delaware. They were big enough to carry cannon across, let's put it that way. In a council of war on the 23rd, they planned to cross the Delaware and assault Trenton. There was actually a plan to cross also south of Trenton, but the southern wing of the plan was unable to cross the river because of the weather. The, the river actually had ice flows in it, and south of, the, of Trenton, you couldn't get across. The northern ring crossed the river Christmas night. The password that night was victory or death. The Battle of Trenton. At 4 a.m. December 26, 4,000 men had crossed the river up here and were marching towards Trenton. They had artillery support. They encountered some Hessian outposts. The Hessians were not caught everybody drunk and asleep. Most of them were asleep, but they had outposts. They had, they even had patrols that were out, but they did not anticipate, they did not see this coming. Rawl ordered his regiments to form at the lower end of King Street here and attack. Cannon fire stopped them. Breaking ranks, the Hessians fled. Rawls' cannon then came into action, but they were soon silenced. The Hessians retreated into an orchard, and I believe that was down in here. They were offered terms of surrender, and they agreed. The Hessians suffered approximately 11 or 1,000 casualties. Very, very few Continentals were either killed or wounded. That was the Battle of Trenton. Conclusion, 1776 began with a measure of triumph, Boston, and defeat, Quebec. The middle of 76 was mostly defeat. The revolt was in jeopardy. But it ended with two dim lights at the end of the tunnel, the victory at Trenton and the emergence of the support of France. It was followed almost immediately by Washington's victory at Princeton in 1777, but that's for another story, another time. Any question? Yeah, George, George, did did he talk anything about what the what the civilians were doing there during this time? Did yes, he did. There's a lot of information about <clears throat> the British troops were raping and pillaging, but the Continental troops were also pillaging. It was. If you were a civilian and these these groups of people were, were going through your towns, you were in jeopardy no matter who they were. <laughs>
supposedly the Brits were even worse than the than the uh, Continental and militia, but the militia were very willing to take what they wanted, whether you wanted to give it up or not. And did he talk about the uh, prisoner boats on, off of New York? Yes, New he York did. And, and I, I thought about including that, Jerry. There's a lot of information about prisoners of war on both sides. The colonists treated prisoners a lot better than the British did. Half of the prisoners that were captured by the Brits died of one form or another of malnutrition, starvation, disease and whatnot yeah. it was there's a whole section of that I, that was more than i had time for to put it mildly what was the population of the united states at that time or the colonies three and a half million not that large the continental army wasn't that large the british army wasn't that large the british army had a hundred thousand men at its most Continental Army probably had somewhere more than half of that. They were not big groups of people. They were using flintlock types of, of weapons, but cannon were, at least as you read what he said, they were fly, firing canister, they were firing explosive shells. The cannon were probably doing as much damage as anything else. They also used the bayonet. Several charges wound up with bayonet charges. George, do you know, um, were, were the British distracted? Were they also, you know, involved in some kind of a conflict someplace else on the planet at that time? Not or, that I have read about of substance, but they certainly weren't going to, to uh, take all of their forces away from other places where they were literally keeping the populations there under subjugation. So they raised additional units. Like I said, they, they did not have a large army to start with. What they had was all over the world. And what they sent to the colonies was as much foreign troops as it was almost as much as it was British troops. A lot of whom had never been in battle. They did not have a lot of experienced veterans from the Seven Years' War. George, one of the big reasons that uh, the British didn't have a large army was they didn't have borders with other countries. France, on the other hand, had to maintain an extremely large army because they had so many borders. And the British idea of maintaining their border was the Navy. And the British Navy yes. was, the, the, I, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> their, their calculation was they wanted a Navy bigger than all the rest of the world combined. So yeah, that they, was- that They was also what, relied on alliances, you know to- Sorry? They relied on alliances with other, other countries, other monarchs, you know, all True. those monarchs were interrelated and, you know- True cousins and uncles and nephews they fought with each other shifted back and forth depending on what somebody wanted at a point in time yeah that's right because yeah george uh, you mentioned charles lee ambition was to head the continental forces in i think you said 1773 how, how did he oh, even 1776 oh it's 76 yeah well, he came to this country with the ambition. Remember how Washington was assigned Continental Army commander? He showed up at a Continental Congress meeting in a uniform. And he was the only one there who looked like he knew what he was doing, so they made him commanding general. So up until then, it wasn't clear who was going to be commanding the Continental Army. And, and Lee was one of the people who wanted that job. So was Gage. There were a number of colonialists. Arnold thought he deserved it. Arnold was an outstanding general. Anything else, guys? 
So the British had already kind of declared war to put down the rebellion before we declared independence. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. 